Chapter 6 According to the same phone book that had squealed on the Beaumont Gallery, John O'Shaughnessy, Bridget's roommate, lived at six and one quarters Grove, about a block and a half from the Pearl. Six and a quarter turned out to be part of a cluster of houses you'd call picturesque, meaning partially crummy, but crummy antique. They were two-story houses, the kind made of bricks that had faded to pinkish with patches of white, and had little white shutters and little white doors, and they sat in a courtyard, a cobblestone square with a tree in the center and houses for walls. The tree was a fir tree, and one of the neighbors had gussied it up with some lights and a star, and it looked pretty festive. I skirted the tree and got down to the houses. There seemed to be twelve, four in the center and four on the sides. O'Shaughnessy's portion, the first on the left, gave me four little windows which didn't much help, not with three of them darkened and all of them shut. The one with the lights on, at least, was convenient. A first-story job with an adequate sill and an absence of curtains. I peered through the panes. On the opposite side was a Tiffany lampshade, a lit-up kaleidoscope perched on a desk that was pushed to the window. I narrowed my eyes and then squinted beyond it and into a room that was shadowy quiet and totally still. A corduroy sofa, a small TV, a couple of bookshelves with plenty of books and a photo of Bridget asleep on a chair. I pricked up my ears and continued to listen. Nothing. Nobody home. I checked out the desk that was under the window. The back of an envelope, covered with scrawls. A couple of three for a dollar ball points, with one of them missing and torn from the pack. A chain with car keys and some kind of metal. I wasn't excited. I squinted some more. An old-fashioned typewriter sat at the side with a blank piece of paper arranged in its jaws that had two little words on it. Chapter 1, Upside Down, and then inches of nothing. The paper was curled as though no one had moved it since April was young, and it didn't seem hopeful that anyone would. On the blotter beside it, conveniently angled for easier reading, a typewritten page said, McAllister's Gold the long-awaited sequel to the prize-winning novel Moonshot by John D. O'Shaughnessy. Mr. O'Shaughnessy seemed to be blocked. I knew the feeling. That pain in the gut when the words didn't happen and the thoughts don't arrive. What arrived in their places, it seemed, were the bills. They were marked second notice, and sat in a pile with a half-crumpled letter whose printed border said, Quibble and Quibble, Attorneys at Law, and began with a greeting, Eviction Notice. First, whereas, it announced in italics, italics scare me as much as whereas, which is why lawyers use them, Whereas, it proclaimed, your owner-slash-landlord requires the use of your rent-controlled dwelling to use for himself. Well, no wonder the guy couldn't write. Getting evicted in Manhattan is getting evicted from Manhattan. There are simply no apartments here that anyone can afford. So, in ugly truth, he was being deported, banished, exiled to the lap of the fruited plain where the coffee shops close at midnight and the coffee shops close at ten. For most New Yorkers, 
this would be sad. For a New York writer, a special breed that hangs around Kinko's at 2 a.m. with a glazed donut and coffee to go, this would truly be torture. Could even be death. And what about Bridget? Would Bridget go with him? Or else would he dump her? Or else would she split? It was something to think about. Later. At home. I was passing the Christmas tree, smelling the balsam and thinking of nothing, when suddenly... Blam! They fell out of those branches like giant cat bombs and landed in front of me. Three in a row. I examined them quickly. A trio of gangsters with alley cat muscles and glistening teeth. I froze and said, Hi. So glad you dropped in. The probable leader, a red Himalayan, a twenty-pounder with twigs in his fur, said, We got us a joker. His voice was a rasp. It was something like gravel, if gravel could talk and had something to tell you. You want to do jokes? I could give you the punchline. I ducked from the punch, but instead it was verbal. Get off of the case. Case? I said, frowning. What case is that? The reedy lieutenants looked ready to pounce. The red Himalayan had lifted a paw, but then shook his head wearily. Pally, he rasped. You can stop being stupid or start being dead. The case with the kitten. The case that you're on. That's the case I'm dropping? Exactly, he said. The paw settled down again. Both the lieutenants appeared disappointed. Who sent you? I said. Who sent me? He spluttered. Nobody sent me. He thinks someone sent me, he said to his pals. The yellow one snickered. The tabby collapsed in a fit of hysterics. That's stupid, he croaked. So it means we can kill him. He grinned at his boss. Can we kill him now, slasher? Be patient, Magoo. But he thinks Mr. G. Will ya button your yapper? The red Himalayan made sounds in his throat like he'd swallowed a motor. He growled at the thug and then rolled up his eyeballs and dropped them on me. Just forget that he said that. Forget he said what? Master G! He exploded. Why, Slasher, I said. It's completely forgotten. And so is the case. I stared at him, frowning. What case? I said. You want I should eat him? The yellow one offered. The slasher ignored him and stayed with my face. I will try to be patient, he said. And patience is not what I'm good at. He lowered his voice and then swallowed more hardware. Again he looked up. And so let us review, he said, practically crooning. Now what did I tell you? he said, to forget. Mr. G, I said promptly. He choked on a cog, or perhaps an axle. You didn't forget. You're supposed to forget that I said, Mr. G. What you're supposed to remember, he said, is the case that I said to remember you're supposed to forget. Are you getting it, Pally? It's not like it's hard. If you didn't remember the case to forget, you'd forget to remember I said to forget it. 
He glared at me. Got it. I nodded. I do. And I'm gonna remember it, Slasher. I will. And don't you forget it. He showed me some teeth. Now scram, he said tightly, before I get mad. <laughs>